Welcome to St. Martin in the Fields and welcome to Great Sacred Music and a special welcome to those joining us online. Well, today is my Christmas present because we've got a very, very special treat, not just for you, but also for me today. And if you don't know what it is, you're going to get a nice surprise in a moment. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Bob Chilcott, who, like me, is a West Countryman born in Plymouth a lifelong association with choral music as a chorister and choral scholar in the choir of King's College, Cambridge, and also uh, later as a member of the King's Singers. He became a full-time composer and conductor in 1997, and his output since then has been nothing short of prodigious. His most often performed pieces include Can You Hear Me, A Little Jazz Mass, Requiem, and my own personal favorite, the St. John Passion. Bob has directed choirs in 30 countries worldwide and has particular association with the BBC as principal guest conductor of the BBC Singers and he's also principal conductor of Birmingham University Singers. And the most exciting thing about Bob Chilcott is that he is here today and he's going to talk about his own music in a few moments time when I give him the microphone. But it's our tradition at Great Sacred Music to sing together towards the beginning and towards the end and we're going to do that now if you've found the sheets if you haven't found the sheets and you're in the building they're just towards the back of the central aisle um, and you'll find on the inside left hand page of the sheet a little town of Bethlehem which you may recognize Phillips Brooks was rector of Trinity Church in Boston and later the Bishop of Massachusetts 
and he wrote this hymn for the Sunday School when he was rector at Holy Trinity Philadelphia. He visited Bethlehem in 1865. This is one of the classic hymns that is actually an American hymn, of course, and when you spend time in America, as I did for a number of years, as many of you will know, uh, you find they sing a different tune. And we always say that's the wrong tune, but this is an American carol, so they can sing it to any tune they like. Um, but we, of course, sing it to Ralph, Ralph Vaughan Williams, a setting of a folk tune uh, that he placed in his 1906 English hymnal, which was sung to him by a man from Forest Green in Surrey, which is why the tune is called Forest Green. And it's a, it's a very subtle uh, carol, unlike some carols. Uh, it has two main themes, one about charity and faith, uh, and the other about the coming of Christ into the human heart. And its transition at the beginning of verse 3, as you'll notice, is this beautiful touch, very elegantly simple, how silently, how silently. So it goes from the more cerebral theme of charity and faith to the very tender theme of Christ entering the human theme at heart, and it does it through this little transition how silently, how silently, when suddenly it all becomes tender and soft and gentle and intimate. We remain seated, the voices stand and lead us as we sing, O little town of Bethlehem. And then after that, it's all Bob. <laughs>
Well, a big thank you there to Dr. Sam Wells for such a nice welcome to me. Um, many thanks. It's a tremendous privilege, really, when, as a composer, to have such a distinguished group as St. Martin's Voices singing your music, and uh, particularly at this time of year, it's very special, so thank you for that. Um, the choir are going to sing a couple of pieces which I'll introduce. The first, uh, actually the second one of these is a piece called The Shepherd's Carol, and I wrote this in 2000 for King's College Cambridge for their televised Christmas service, um, and it was the theme of the service was about the shepherds, and the, the dean um, gave me a bunch of, uh, of texts about the shepherds, and this one really stood out. It's an anonymous text, but strangely enough, when you hear it, you, you might hear that it sounds quite contemporary. Um, it's a very beautiful text, and it was really special for me to write a piece for the choir that I used to sing in. I can, I can tell you for a fact, when I went to the service, I was terrified. Um, but first they're going to sing a, a short setting of um, the first of seven O antiphons. Now the O antiphons are the um, antiphons that are sung before the Magnificat. Traditionally they were sung before the Magnificat, the seven last days of Advent. And um, I wrote this piece as a complete set of seven antiphons. I wrote it actually for the choir of the cathedral in Reykjavik in Iceland, and I had a wonderful week there. You may be interested that the choir there had 55 people in the choir, and they had a German conductor actually, a man who'd come from Leipzig to um, take the job. He managed to get out. It was when it was East Germany. He got out of... Um, uh, Leipzig and came to Iceland and of course nobody wanted at that point nobody wanted German conductors so they didn't have any singers and slowly they got some singers together and this choir was a wonderful choir actually but the fact was um, that choir had remained the same membership for 25 years so clearly they enjoyed both singing in the choir and they enjoyed their lovely conductor. But anyway, this uh, antiphon is called O Sapientia, O Wisdom, and it says, O Wisdom, teach us the way of prudence.
They're really good, aren't they? <laughs> Fantastic. Um, the next piece is a setting of the first Noel. Now, I was asked earlier in the year to write a piece for a campaign that the Church of England were having called Follow the Star, which they've been running this Christmas. And it's a campaign, really, to get people um, singing in church. And um, uh, they asked if I'd make a new setting of the first Noel. Now, just interestingly, just now, um, and we're rather thrilled because um, the World at One got in touch last week and said, I understand you're writing a new um, setting of the first Noel, um, and could, could we talk to you about it? So I, I rang Andrew up, Andrew Eris, the director of music here, and said, would you, would you be able to, um, you know, help out with this? And of course, this place is marvelous. It has all the ability to do that, and which it did. So um, uh, Johnny Diamond and his colleague came, and they, they interviewed us about this piece. Um, and of course, the first thing that Andrew was asked is, what is a carol? And he s sat there, almost completely not knowing what to say, because of course, what is a carol? It is actually rather difficult to, uh, to um, identify what that is. Is it something we all sing together? Or is it something that the choir sings? Or is it something, traditionally, it's, it's a song that could be sung at any time of year. Um, anyway, this particular piece has a new tune. And you, you know that you're taking your life in your hands when you have a very well-known text to which you're writing a new tune. But the whole idea about this was to try and write something that would be singable, um, memorable, with a, a chorus that at least um, people might remember. Um, Noel, Noel, born is the king of Israel. I, I love refrains and choruses because there's a kind of democracy about them. You, you understand that people really do understand that they might not know a song, but they can get the chorus. Um, there's something wonderful about that to me, and it's why I love him so much, actually. Um, but anyway, we're going to sing it for you now. It's, um, uh, I, I made it as dance-like as I could, and because it's five verses, which is quite long for a hymn, I made it move as quickly as I could. So here we have the first Noel.
We're going to go back to a traditional uh, carol now. If you'd like to look inside your sheets, we're going to sing together something uh, where both the words and the tune are familiar. It came upon a midnight clear. This has actually got quite a lot in common with O Little Town in Bethlehem. The first thing it's got in common was that it was also composed in Massachusetts, this time in 1843. This is actually 20 years older than O Little Town of Bethlehem, even though people think of it as a very contemporary carol because it addresses uh, themes like the end of war. Uh, another thing it's got in common is that it has a different English tune from the American tune and we're used to singing it to Arthur Sullivan as in Gilbert and Sullivan's uh, folk tune uh, that he adapted like Vaughan Williams did the, the other carol from a traditional folk song. Um, this, uh, what's really different about It Came Upon a Midnight Clear from O Little Town of Bethlehem is whereas O Little Town of Bethlehem, like a carol like Hark the Herald Angels Sing, is absolutely steeped and soaked in theology uh, and doctrine. That, uh, it Came Upon a Midnight Clear, if you look at it closely, it has practically no doctrine whatsoever. And the reason for that is it's written by a Unitarian minister who you know, isn't particularly keen on talking about the true meaning of Christmas as Christ being fully human and fully divine because he doesn't recognize Christ as fully divine as, as Unitarians don't. They're not Trinitarian believers. So this is all about the message. It's just about, you know, whereas what the peril we've just heard really takes us through the whole of the Christmas story, uh, this doesn't take us through the whole of Christmas story at all. This is just the angel's mes message to the shepherds, and it's really just... Peace, peace on earth, goodwill uh, to all people. That's kind of all Christmas is. But it makes a whole carol just out of that very thin, practically non-theological message. So it's, it, it seems like just another of all those carols, but actually it's quite different from most of the carols because it is a Unitarian carol. And the, it turns out the Unitarians uh, have quite a lot to say at Christmas and have some pretty good tunes too. So we can enjoy it very much as the church has done for nearly 200 years. We remain seated. The voices stand and lead us as we sing, It Came Upon a Midnight Clear.
well, we're coming towards the end of Great Sacred Music uh, for this week. If you've enjoyed yourself, particularly our special treat, uh, then uh, I hope you have. Uh, there's an opportunity to make a donation, cash or card, uh, as you depart. And if you're joining us online, you can text. You can go on the website and you can give us upwards of a million pounds. And that would be absolutely marvelous. Uh, we're doing five lessons and carols, just an abbreviated nine lessons and carols next week, if you'd like to join us at the same time uh, next Thursday. But um, it's been a huge treat for me to hear Bob talk about his music, the circumstances in which it's been composed. Uh, and I'm going to give him the last word, particularly to say a few words about Nova. Nova. Thank you so much, and thank you to St. Martin's and to St. Martin's Voices for this concert. A great thrill for me. Um, the, the choir are going to end with the uh, carol Nova Nova, Ave Fit Ex Ava. Now, this is an ancient text from the 15th century, and it's a macaronic text, which means it's written in English and Latin. And it has, uh, the English tells the story of the, um, the birth of Christ. And this uh, refrain comes back again and again and again, Nova, Nova, Ave Fit Ex Eva. Actually, it's a very clever uh, text because it says, Nova, uh, news, news, Ave, um, welcome, fit becomes Eva which is Mary, and Ava is Ave backwards. So whoever was doing it was probably pulling a fast one over another poet to prove he was a better poet. He or she was a better poet. And I wrote this for the 80th birthday of the conductor Sir David Wilcox for the Bach Choir, and he conducted it actually in the Royal Albert Hall. And he said to me before, he said, because it has a lot of meter change in it. It's quite lively. It has a lot of meter change. And he said, you wrote all those meter changes to try and catch me out, didn't you? And I said, uh, I, I said, I could never do that. Anyway, this is Nova Nova to finish the concert. <laughs> 